All right. On a warm August afternoon in 2016, I joined Anna Halperin for an outdoor lunch at her home in Kentfield. Seated on the back terrace in the screened in summer room, floating above the sloping hillside and shaded by redwoods, I turned to her and asked, Anna, what is the most important thing about your work you want remembered? Without a pause, she replied that Larry and my work is not related to nature. We are nature. I've been concerned about my legacy, she continued. I want to be sure that people understand my concern with nature and the effect that nature has on your body. So I'd like to use this occasion of reflecting on Anna's life to honor this request. To think more deeply about what being nature might mean for the work of Anna and Lawrence Halperin and the imprint of the California landscape they brought to American art. How did this seemingly simple intent to recenter the body in nature effectively reset the agenda for dance and urban design internationally from the second half of the 20th century through to the present day. In their lifetimes, both were celebrated as distinguished solo artists. But with the passing of Anna on May 24th of this year, just a few weeks shy of her 101st birthday, a long-term view of their joint artistic legacy is possible. As Anna and Larry did so often in their lifetimes, let's begin outside. Through the long remarkable lives of this acclaimed couple, the outdoors was their steadiest collaborator and greatest inspiration. I argue that it was specifically the landscape of California that resulted in their being impacted by nature and its temporality so profoundly. Their cultural heritage as Jewish Americans, she was essentially first generation, and the timing of their encounter mattered as well. They arrived in San Francisco within days of World War II ending. They were primed to affect social change through their recent exposure to Bauhaus philosophy with its emphasis on social participation and the elimination of art elitism. They established themselves professionally as artists in the Bay Area, as revelations of the scale of Holocaust horrors were disseminating. Soon they began to shape their art as mediums with forward agendas of liberalism, social justice, incorporating the Hebrew call for Jews to live lives of social responsibility in repair of the world. This ethos of being nature informed their lives on multiple levels. For 69 years, their family home was this compact, modernist, redwood and glass structure, perched on a dramatic wooded three-acre site Larry selected on the bayside flank of Mount Tamalpais in the affluent suburb of Kentfield in Marin County. It offered a panoramic vista stretching from the San Francisco Bay to Berkeley, revealing urban development cascading across a stunning setting of nature. For both Halprins, nature and the impinging tensions of its development was never merely a backdrop. One was both in nature and continually sensing its presence as a dynamic framework for movement through the glass walls of the house's rooms and the open dance deck. This deck, Anna's main space for teaching and performing, was a wooden platform below the house in a forested grove, which one descended to via a curving staircase of wooden planks. Larry and lighting designer Arch Lauderer designed it jutting off the hillside 
30 feet in the air at one point over descending groves of madrone redwood, bay, oak. Nature was partner, mentor, model for the Halprins. Their work and their pedagogy was designed to lead people to experience firsthand these sensual pleasures of landscapes, power, and ecological processes. In reflecting on Larry's work after his death in 2009, Anna said, his talent was in understanding the singular natural potential of special places. Every decision on the human and environmental impact was studied with meticulous attention to detail, she said. Indeed, for both Halprins, it was not just that they spent time in nature. They read it with the embodied, visceral, and analytic intensity customarily used to study a great work of choreography or architecture. And it functioned as that for them. And this is an image here of Anna on the deck with Simone Forti, John Graham, two of the early dancers she worked with, and Larry on the Sonoma coast on the site of what will become Sea Ranch um, as he camped on the sands there to really absorb the microclimes and get a feel for the land and what it needed and didn't by way of development. Now, the idea of framing Anna and Larry's legacy has always seemed a daunting prospect during their lifetimes. The two of them were so ceaseless in their invention and productivity. They always roamed freely across traditional disciplinary divides in the arts. Their work also straddled social politics. It was facilitated by financial and class privilege and urban development yet it was dedicated to fostering a reciprocal relationship between people and more livable environments. So it was a challenge to keep up, let alone contextualize their work. Both remained astoundingly productive until the very end of their lives. What a man does is what a man is. Larry was fond of quoting Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is an image of Anna at 95 in Israel, performing with the Vertigo Dance Company for reconstruction of parades and changes. And Larry at 89, when he was commissioned to redesign the Yosemite Falls Corridor in Yosemite National Park. In addition to the catalog of choreography and urban monuments, major artists in dance and environmental design customarily leave behind, the Halprins left another more enduring legacy, their process. Rather than just appending social impact as a flourish at the end of their work, they instead conceived of design from its earliest processes as designing to reach and expand the inner lives of people. Across 70 years of Anna's dance and Larry's environmental design work, the Halprins used landscape as research and the rhythms of nature to shape their processes. In their field work, they curated biological time observing, for example, how a curtain of water cascades over a cliff, or how a body finds its equilibrium while racing down a steep hillside. Then in the studio, they slowed time as they manipulated these discoveries from the field, processing them in workshops, and finally compressing and distilling them into the liveness of performance as an ecological awakening. In their hands, California's environment was transformed into a blueprint for aesthetic, social, and civic engagement. They played with time as well as a vital and elastic medium in both their work. They also juggled tensions between aspiring to a radical aesthetic and group inclusivity versus the need for their authorial control in shaping the final product. 
Because Anna and Larry drew so heavily from nature, there are not firm divides between the stages they move through from discovery to process and finished product. And so here I've broken it out into three stages, field work, with the image in the upper corner of Anna and Larry and the architect Charles Moore on the Sonoma coast in 1966. This is the future site of Sea Ranch. And then two years later, um, when they led a collaborative workshop there with architects and dancers, experiments in the environment. And there's Anna reclining across a piece of driftwood, Daria on the drums, at the far end of the driftwood. And then the third stage of performance, which is a term Larry also used for his finished um, urban design work. And this is now the completed sea ranch. And whether it's inhabited by bodies of people vacationing there or a designed performance by Anna, it all falls under that large category of moving bodies um, with intention in a pre-chosen space. In the 1960s, the Halprins um, collaboratively worked to codify these archetypal processes of nature into the RSVP cycle. This is a process for creating design that could provide experience parallel to the structure of nature. And I give you get Larry's schematic here in the upper corner, VP. It allows for our resources to feed into a design plan S score, following that into the finished form of performance P, which gets evaluated through value action. And then the resources are changed, the score gets modified and the performance evolves, and so it becomes this cycle. So now I'm going to move through, for the rest of the talk, these sort of three large clusters of the stages of their process, beginning here with field work, the work in nature, uh, and biological time. Alert to the tactile, the sonic, and the kinesthetic, the Halprins worked outdoors all year round. Over time, this immersion in nature led them to move away from optically centered art. Instead, they focused on how space, forms, and time affect our ability to take in sensorial information, and how by adjusting these, immersive participation in environments can be fostered. As they sensed nature with their whole body, Anna in improvisations with fallen tree branches and rehearsals conducted on leaf strewn decks slicked by rain. Larry experienced nature through extended backpacking treks into the high Sierras and days spent camping and sketching. And they both began to reconsider the boundaries of art. They converged in viewing their art as an interactive civic theater that aspired to transform people's lives. And this is a sample of a photo of the kind of waterfall Larry would have encountered in the Sierras, his resulting sketch to sort of capture, analyze, metabolize that environment, and then how it would play out eventually in his urban designs, in this instance, the Portland open space waterfalls of Lovejoy Plaza. That the drama of the landscape had its own rhythms from the start for them is apparent in how Larry described the very ecology of California in an early lecture he gave in 1957. And I've printed out a statement that I'll read with you from that lecture, accompanied by two sketches that Larry made. Again, the kind of schematic and then a watercolor. California starts at the Pacific water's edge with great cliffs of sculptured rock. It then moves inland across the coastal range of rolling hills covered with live oak and chaparral. 
Inland, the coastal ranges flatten, and finally it climbs fast into the range of light, that great upended knife edge of rocks and small glacial lakes and mountain meadows called Sierra Nevada. All this change happens in a comparatively short space so that we are particularly aware of these changing landscapes in the environment all around us. Larry's description here reveals his view of nature as actually dancing itself and choreographing the movements of those who pass through it. One can sense Larry exporting from this time in nature a new approach to design as the creation of spaces that shape lives. He increasingly incorporated varied environments for the moving body, constructing landscapes that heightened a respect for nature and made more modest humanity's presence in it. An example from this period is again, the Portland open space sequence developed between 1965 and 78 an eight block tree-lined pedestrian mall sequence, it operates like a stage set of the California landscape with topographical contours, a mounded green interlude, and fountains that echo the salmon ladders on the Columbia River, Cascade and Sierra Mountains. It even has Mesoamerican pyramids and the mesas and cliffs of the American Southwest. Larry called Lovejoy Plaza here a theater where events can occur. He continued, I hope that they would use the water, climb the cascade, wade in the pool, listen to the sounds, and use the entire composition as a giant play structure, which would heighten and enrich the normal everyday life activity in the neighborhood, he said. When the Halprins began attending to nature in Northern California as research for their art, thinking about the environment was more a cultural and aesthetic than political concern. This gave them license for a certain innocence or purity of method early on, allowing them to foreground the physical rather than the decorative or anxiety about ecological disaster, which would come later. And this is Larry's sketch for the Portland sequence. I showed you just the first of what are really three rooms of it. I include this because if you see in his notation at the bottom, he calls it a choreographed sequence of open spaces. Landscape as a shaping force was present for Anna and Larry even before they arrived in California. Larry's time on a kibbutz in Israel as a young teen has often been cited as decisive in illuminating for him how tightly integrated the social life of communities is with the land. Anna came from a public school system in Winnetka, Illinois that modeled philosopher John Dewey's experience-based learning and belief that schools are communities where real life tasks and problems should be used to develop individuals' capacity to contribute to society. For both, nature and the outdoors had also been part of their college lives at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where Larry studied botany as a graduate student before taking a degree in landscape architecture at Harvard. There he absorbed the Bauhaus aesthetic of Walter Gropius and his pedagogy of joining fine and practical arts to affect social change. At UW, Anna studied dance with Margaret Dobler, who often staged her students dancing outdoors. She was also Anna's inspiration for using blindfolds as a means of directing her students' attention inward in the dance studio for metaphorical field trips into how their limbs and joints moved. Anna and Larry were married in 1940 while both were still students at UW. Separated when Larry enlisted in the Navy, they reunited in 1945 when Anna moved to San Francisco from the East Coast 
to join Larry as the war ended. They came west to start their lives, their work, their family. And from there forward, the three were always commingled. Shortly before journeying west, Anna was already anticipating the impact of the environment on her as a dance maker. And this is a quote from Anna, which I'll read with you, you can read as well. Now I'm glad I'm going to California. I want to be left alone, live a normal, resourceful life with a connection to the soil and to the common pulse of ordinary people. I'm not interested in a claim. I'm only interested in creating out of the soil and the people a healthy, fresh dance that's alive and vital. I'm getting so sick and tired of New York dance. It's neurotic, eccentric, and in many cases stale, and in most cases uninspired. I'm not being smug. I don't say I can do better, but I do say New York itself breeds a warped kind of dance. In New York, dance modernism headed by Martha Graham was the dominant aesthetic then. And it was relayed through a top-down hierarchy designed to transfer to each student movement that Graham made on her own body to prepare them to perform her autobiographical dances. Doris Humphrey, Graham's contemporary with whom Anna studied, worked in a similar way as did the majority of this first generation of modern dancers. Anna's goal of creating a fresh dance out of the soil echoes the kibbutznik idealism of Larry here. In the 1960s, the Halprins led a series of legendary workshops together, experiments in the environment. At their Kentfield home in Marin, in San Francisco, and at the Northern California Coastal Development of Sea Ranch. They focused on dance and landscape architecture. And these workshops held in 1966, 68, and 71 were designed to help people experience movement and spaces in new and unexpected ways, giving the designers and dancers who participated a changed perspective on their place in the world. As the Halprin shared and refined their methods for erasing boundaries between indoors and outdoors, between found in nature and human made, between the linear time of fieldwork and research and the slow time of process and the compressed time of performance, they taught that there are no hard boundaries between designed movement, designed environments, and the structure of nature. Over time, they led hundreds to experience the environment, the human body, and resistance to the accelerated time of technology as part of human experience. The Halprin's workshops grounded communities in their natural, built, and effective environments. And this is, these are a series of images here from that 68 workshop. Dari is in a lot of pictures here and there she is behind Larry in that slide on the left. This is a gravity giving the weight of a body exercise and Anna's right there in the midst of that cluster of dancers. So these workshops included blindfolded trust walks, as you see here, self-portraiture and drawing, awareness walks where groups of the participants would journey into Market Street in downtown San Francisco and absorb the environment and be alert to it in a much different way than as they routinely pass through during their working day. They also built driftwood villages on the ranch, on the Sea Ranch coast. These were new pluralistic approaches to art making. And these discoveries unfolded in the slow time of nature. They compelled one to quiet with enhanced attention to the world they found outdoors, exercising flexibility and adaptability. 
blurring the lines between nature and art and the distinct conceptions of time in each, their work has asked, how can dance and environmental design be more open to the vitality and the temporal experience of being in nature? What prompts a creative outcome rather than a predetermined solution? How do we get there? This photo of casual nudity is one of the more iconic images of the Halprin's workshops, but it too has been easily dismissed as simply aligning them with the progressive momentum of sexual liberation, signifying openness, vulnerability, and naturalness. However, reading this through the context of California in the 60s, and this comes from the 68 workshop, this use of the nude body in nature links their legacy with the more complicated politics of Cold War suburban culture and its flirtation with domestic nudism. California was in the vanguard here and the setting for photos in mainstream magazines like House Beautiful, where nude sunbathing by white heterosexual couples in private enclosed patios was normalized as an ideal of natural living in modern architecture, authenticating a free body as part of a modernist lifestyle. Straddling this with the counterculture ethos of San Francisco at the time, the Halprins experimented with ways to have a natural body while successfully bridging urban, rural, and suburban environments. De-eroticized nudity appears in a variety of contexts in their work in this period. In the workshops that I showed you a slide of, and it happens at Sea Ranch as well as Kentfield, and in at least one instance, in a formal meeting in their home. And this is Larry meeting with the psychologist, Paul Baum and Charles Amerkanian with his back to this photo, um, who is a composer and musician, and then Anna joining in this discussion. When I showed Anna this photo in December, 2019, she laughed heartily. That's so funny, she said. Looking back now as a 99 year old at what was once a radical gesture as comic in its awkward earnestness. Through their lives, the Halprins also pursued their work and field work separately. During the 60s, Larry journeyed into the California Sierras annually for extended summer backpacking and nature sketching trips. And he took his two young daughters, Daria pictured here and Rana. And this is a screen capture from a, a moving image. So apologies that it's a bit blurry. The same time, Anna was teaching her own influential summer workshops in Kentfield. These were lessons in attending to nature and curating kinesthetic data gathered from close observation. Under her tutelage, students learned to manipulate time through these discoveries of the slow time of observation into the dense time of performance. Her task performances allowed students to discover how to harvest the performance possibilities from childhood games, psychological encounters, and prosaic daily actions and objects like those that resulted from Trisha Brown repetitively sweeping the outdoor deck with a broom in this 1960 workshop, or Yvonne Rayner in the same workshop, slowly emptying the contents of her purse as a dance. And Trisha is the woman on the far left who's brushed her hair completely covering her face. Anna's the figure all in white um, on the stairs, the, topmost white figure, and Yvonne is to her immediate right. In these early years, fieldwork, process, and performance could tumble together, seeming to unfold simultaneously, fieldwork as performance. A case in point is Hangar, filmed in 1957 at an airport hangar at San Francisco airport under construction. 
This is the earliest performance footage of Anna using a natural and built landscape to script and score human movement. And it's a tiny flickering moment of them working in the dangerous scaffolding here of the hangar under construction. And then you'll see a bit of workshop process of Ceremony of Us from 68, and then a much earlier 50s snippet of Anna dancing solo on the deck. And you'll hear her talking over this about process, and you'll see also um, a text at the bottom if you can't understand the, the speaking. I was trying to get at something more basic, more humanistic. And I did that by using ordinary movement. If you're a dancer, your body is your instrument. And within the body is all that you are. Now we move into the second part, process. I call this slow time. Process is a curious and amorphous stage in the making of an aesthetic object. Usually the most private and usually the most hidden, it is where some chaos is always present. To say that the Halperin's legacy is process then is to celebrate their comfort with discomfort and uncertainty. Both worked in mediums that change and disappear, living bodies and public spaces subject to changes in civic sentiments and needs. This has helped shift the focus from exclusively the objects that, that they created to the how and why of their manner of making art, procedural and participatory. Looking for a deeper relationship between art and life and ways to foster more creative outcomes in the design process, Anna and Larry reassessed their belief in what art should do. And this is just a statement that Larry made about slow choreography and dreaming. I'll read it with you. My dreams and reveries are peopled by landscapes, rocks, fissures, platforms and outcroppings through which people in solemn processions move. They encounter each other in theatrical settings in a slow and carefully articulated choreography. So here again is that spill from urban design into dance choreography. As the Halprins imported the time of nature into their processes, the message was that natural and urban worlds were replete with scores just ready to be discovered. As here in Anna's 1970 blank placard dance, an active and passive protest it features the San Francisco Dancers Workshop members and others in a typical protest image of the time. But instead of political slogans, these dancer protesters all carry blank posters. Marching carrying a blank placard aloft thus becomes a choreography of protesting protesting and the over-policing of public assemblies like this. The lesson? All experience could be data for art. Their practice-based research work was a perpetual cross-disciplinary and collaborative process across the art forms of landscape architecture and dance, the public, the private, the political. A profound hybridizing of these disciplines. Both believed deeply that their art had the capacity know the responsibility to optimize public life through art making as a participatory process for a diversity of citizens. They refined processes for making more inclusive the stages of discovery, invention, curation for the communities that would inhabit the results. For both, there was an implicit social politics to their work. Larry was working to mitigate the civic damage of shopping malls 
and federal policies of urban renewal that as architectural historian Allison Hirsch has noted, severed deep roots that had grounded communities in their physical environment. Anna's approach to art making similarly tried to redress the emotional and physical alienation and estrangement of the post-war era. With its anxieties around conformity and the prohibitions around the sensual body. An example here is her 1966, The Bath, which used the dancer's own improvisations with water and their bodies to probe basic tasks like bathing, dunking, pouring, in response to Anna's interest in clarifying relationships through a focus on ordinary actions. Reading these actions, she said, these say how we really feel about each other. Similarly, water was also a dynamic resource in Larry's major urban projects because of what he called the atavistic urge to participate, it triggers. Toward the late 1960s, as the optimism of the initial early years of that decade faded, Anna also began to experiment with the trauma of dystopic urban environments. Her 10 myths, staged in 1967 at her 361 Divisadero Street studio, commandeered the audience as participants in a sensory assault. In the myth called Atonement, and this is the score for Atonement, spectators were instructed to stand or lie flat, immobile for an extended period of time before a wall of newspapers with screaming headlines while facing into blinding lights. In another section, personal boundaries were breached by instructing the audience to intimately touch the faces of strangers and be touched. Toward the very end of the decade, race emerged as an explicit subject in both of their processes and works. And here the politics became complicated and emotional stakes too fraught to trust to open process alone. So Anna incorporated psychologist Paul Baum as a resource, as did Larry for the process stages of some of his projects. Responding to the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968 and the 1965 Watts riots, Anna accepted an invitation to work with the actors of Studio Watts in Southern California. Creating what she called her multiracial group, she spent several months shuttling between San Francisco and Los Angeles as she and the dancers built Ceremony of Us. An hour long work that memorializes the process of its own making. From a series of game like tasks between the African American Watts performers and the white and one Asian San Franciscan, it imported the tensions of America's inner cities onto the stage of the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. A lived experiment in attempting to erase boundaries prohibitions and taboos, Ceremony of Us became an unwitting reenactment of sexual, racial, and class divides, as was true of so much early race conscious work of this era. Ceremony of Us aspired to achieve the same kind of social repair that Larry's urban-centered projects addressed. However, with dance, it was finally impossible for the performers to get fully outside of the social systems and racialized consciousness they were endeavoring to translate into danced action. In Ceremony of Us, the fieldwork was interior, intimate journeys into the sensate landscapes of black lives in inner city Watts and those of gentrified white hippies in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury. The process was apparent as the games and prompts for eliciting performance sequences from the performers were embedded in the finished work. Larry and Anna's work attenuated time, allowing personal dynamics that fly by in daily life to be revisited with slow attention. 
With Anna and Larry, I think of this intersection and flow of influences of their work across the decades together as scripting lives, or to use the word they both preferred, scoring lives. Both work to shape morally present individuals, primed to actively participate in the physical and social life of cities. And now for the final section, of performance, compressed time. And this is an image of Anna in one of the beautiful still life works uh, of artist Eo Stubblefield. And Anna there is buried corpse-like in this dense bed of redwood mulch. Over the last decades of Anna's life, I watched as dancers from around the world requested permission to restage her works. Her parades and changes, blank placard dance, 10 myths, the courtesan in the crone, five-legged stool. And I show you here a sampling of uh, Anne Collard's reenactment of parades and changes in France, Petronio's courtesan in the crone, and Shaharo Shin's very recent reenactment in Japan of five-legged stool. But repeatedly, it was the process for making the work, actually. It was the process for making this work, the score, her roadmap of resources and intentions that she would provide them that was the most salient artifact of the work. And not surprisingly, these revivals were never as compelling as Anna's original. The one exception is planetary dance a day-long ritual as an advocacy for peace that effectively is its score. Its live reenactment is a capture of what on a particular day, time, and place its participants choose to bring to its structure. Epitomizing Anna's work in nature, it is shaped on body time. Its rhythms are footfalls and the pulse of breath while running. And as the players become winded, the drawing to a close with panting bodies circling close. For Anna, the path into shaping work rather than the artifact of a dance or performance event has long been the most repeatable aspect of her body of work. It's time we consider this as where her aesthetic style and influence also resides. 12 years after Larry's death, his legacy too is coming to be regarded by scholars as not the built work he left behind, but the creative processes he developed and deployed. Architectural historian, Alison Hirsch argues that Larry's creative process together with his many theories drives landscape and urban design today. Now, let's see. Hmm not advancing, not sure. I'm gonna see if I can come out of this for a moment. Seems to have stuck. Hmm, I'm not sure why. Let's see, okay, advanced. Sorry for that glitch. Um, Larry and Anna's processes are the most tangible artifact of their scores. For both of them, these were a means of enriching their work rather than an immediate solution to problems. And this is the Parades and Changes score. Let's see, all right. Both were visual thinkers. Larry was always sketching or painting. And Anna also used drawing in her workshops in the self-portraits participants drew as maps into their interior landscapes, which they then danced. Larry's beautiful scores also memorialize many of Anna's dances, providing roadmaps for those seeking to remount them. The most legendary example of a remounted dance is parades and changes. And the most celebrated two sections of the dance and most frequently revived 
are the undressing, dressing, undressing, dressing, and paper tearing sequences. Here, the functional action of repeatedly taking off and putting on one's clothes, and then later slowly ripping huge lengths of brown paper constitute a series of actions and a frames as a virginal dance. The landscape in focus here is that of the nude body, which flickers into and out of visibility, cloaked by unisex white collar uniforms of a white shirt and dark suit. And I'm gonna show you a very fleeting snippet here from a film that Larry made in 65 of the original Stockholm performance. And I've just identified John Graham, far left, Anna in the middle, tugging down her pants, and AA on the far right. Now, the original commissioned musical score by Morton Sabotnik had specified that a radio be tuned to a local station for this section so that whatever came on the airwaves would be the accompaniment. Yet something made downtown stick as the soundscape for Halperin's turn toward nudity here. And that was the popular Petula Clark song that was being played on the radio at the time. But why a pop song about social disconnection in the midst of densely packed bodies as its theme music? And I'm gonna let you watch a bit of this with the sound. This is the original footage. It's very, very dark, so my apologies. All right, I'm gonna pause there. These bodies undressing to the sound of Petula Clark's urban lament evoke precisely the isolation and alienation in cities that Larry's designs were working to mitigate and redress at the same time. And this is a reconstruction of parades and changes done at the Jewish Community Center. This is a rehearsal in Anna's studio in Kentville. I'm gonna show you a tiny snippet where you can hear her once again talk about process as really what makes this section of dance interesting. As this, everybody began to disrobe, I could hear breathing getting a little heavier in the audience. And then I could hear this whispering, oh, they're not gonna do it. Oh, they did it. You know, like, oh, big deal. And the poor dancers were so unsuspecting. We were so naive about the whole thing. Uh, that it, it just sent chills through through the performers. In parades and changes, they dress and undress three different times. What's exciting for an audience is intuitively to feel that it's in process. It's the process of taking the shoes off. It's the process of undressing. After Larry's death in 20, 2009, Anna made a series of dances over the next several years. She processed mourning for him by revisiting the nude body in nature now as a research site. Using this nudity she inaugurated 50 years earlier, she shaped dance in Song of Songs to ruminate on the sensual body and love remembered from her life with Larry. This was an erotic sketch that Larry had made when he was in the Navy on shipboard, missing her. And this was the dance she made missing him in return in 2011. In 2015, she completed this cycle of remembrance for Larry with Awaken. Set on the rugged Northern California coastline of Larry's Sea Ranch, it emblematizes fieldwork and process as performance. Awaken is also a dance of transcendence, a reuniting of the moving body with nature and the sensual body with the environment. 
It is a marriage of the two mediums these remarkable artists spent their lives teaching us to experience anew. I get continuous nourishment from the cycles of life I observe through nature, Anna confided to me at her 80th birthday celebration. It gives me a sense of eternity. They were guides who shared a curiosity and innocence as they traced forward a faith in how the world and humanity functions. Influential artists are fortunate if their work outlives them, but it is the very rare ones for whom their messy stages of process and revision endure with the same vibrancy as their art. Anna and Larry are unique in their significance as a leading couple in American art in that it is not just the objects they left so much as the processes of arriving at them on which their future reputations will now rest. In giving up so much to the order of the natural world, it turns out they recovered and set in process so much more. Thank you.